The year is 1982, and a new computer science graduate student at UC Berkeley had just published a paper titled Blind Signatures for Untraceable Payments. The paper detailed a way in which anyone could send money to someone else anonymously through the use of cryptography. The paper is advanced and far ahead of its time, but most striking of all, it didn't mention anything about the internet. It had yet to go mainstream and wouldn't for nearly a decade, but when it did, this paper was going to change the world. This is the story of eCash, the first cryptocurrency from the 1980s. I think it's time you meet David Chom, the paper's author. He was born in 1955 in Los Angeles, California. Chom has had an interest in technology his whole life, but his biggest passion seems to be maintaining his privacy while interacting with technology. Chom is such a private guy, we still don't know his exact age or birthday. During his time at UC Berkeley, he published quite a few papers all focused on digital privacy. Arguably, his most important one actually isn't even the one about untraceable payments I discussed earlier. Chom more or less invented the concept of the blockchain protocol, the protocol that virtually every single cryptocurrency uses. The same year he wrote the untraceable payments paper, he published Computer Systems Established maintained and trusted by mutually suspicious groups. This paper would later heavily inspire the creation of Bitcoin, and it's likely without it, Bitcoin would never even exist. But without Bitcoin, that doesn't mean we'd never get cryptocurrency. Despite what most people believe, Bitcoin was not the first cryptography-focused currency. It was actually 14 years late. Now, let's rewind a bit. Chom had finished his paper about untraceable payments and was looking for ways to make it a reality. The world was changing and Chom felt it needed a new form of currency. Despite how groundbreaking and genius it seems today, back then, the reaction was universally negative. The computer science department head at Berkeley told Chom to stop working on the idea. Some of the sharpest minds in privacy at the time didn't like it, and all signs pointed to it being completely useless. But rather than give up on the idea, Chom decided to keep going and search for people to back his project. Luckily for him, he found one soon after, but not exactly for his digital currency. The Dutch government would fund him, but he needed to find a way to implement it into toll booths. So that way, people could pay for the toll without needing physical cash, while also preserving their privacy. So in 1990, he launched DigiCash Inc., where he developed a prototype smart card that could be filled up with digital money at something like an ATM. While driving on the highway, the card would be scanned without you ever needing to stop, and the toll would be paid automatically. Something like that in the 90s would have been absolutely mind-blowing, and even today it'd still be kind of crazy. But unfortunately, it seems the Dutch government never went forward with the project. Even so, Chom is now considered the pioneer of digital money, a space that was rapidly heating up. Big players like Visa and Citibank started to get involved and were even trying to develop their own forms of digital money. The failure of the toll booth project didn't signal the end for Chom and his digital money. In fact, it was only the beginning. Chom began selling a similar smart card system that made his company money for years. But the internet was starting to gain traction and Chom realized it would be the perfect place for digital money, maybe even better than the original use case ideas. So in 1994, along with the team at DigiCash, he created eCash. It was of course heavily inspired by his first paper. Now, eCash is a pretty complex idea, so I'm gonna try and explain it as easily as I can without getting into the technical weeds. So first you open up a bank account somewhere that supports eCash. You would open your eCash wallet on your computer and generate cyber bucks using an account number that nobody knows. I know this sounds like some ridiculous sci-fi movie, but stick with me. Each cyber buck would have its own unique serial number generated using your account number sort of like a Bitcoin wallet's public and private keys. Now, without sending the serial numbers to the bank, after generating your cyber bucks, the bank would withdraw real money from your account and essentially give a sort of digital stamp on your newly generated cyber bucks. Now, let's say you go spend these cyber bucks somewhere online. After sending them, the merchant would see the stamp to know it's legitimate, but would have to verify the serial numbers with the bank. Assuming the bank hasn't accepted that serial number before, they'd know it hadn't been spent in the past, and because of the stamp, they'd also know their legitimate cyber bucks. Now, the bank doesn't actually know who originally owned these cyber bucks because they weren't sent the unique serial numbers when it was generated, so this allows the original owner to spend it at this online shop completely anonymously. Now, this sounds great, 
But what if somebody wanted to use eCash for criminal purposes? Having a bunch of people running around with untraceable money sounds like a horrible idea. Well, let's say somebody says, give me $10 in Cyberbucks or I'll call you mean names on the internet. You could give them the Cyberbucks, but because of the unique serial number on them, you could also alert the bank that you'd been extorted and to keep an eye out for those serial numbers. If someone tries to spend them anywhere, the bank will deny it because the money was obtained illegally. As a result, criminals couldn't use eCash. I guess they could also say, don't tell the bank the serial numbers or I'll break your legs. But hey, not everything's perfect. Now, this all sounds pretty advanced, but the system did work, and for the end user, it was way simpler. The computer and the banks did all the work for you, so creating, sending, and receiving Cyberbucks was as easy as pressing a button on your computer. Now, you might be wondering, this sounds cool, but why did something like eCash need to exist? Well, this was the early days of the internet, and back then, things were changing every day. There were two ways people believed that companies of the future would be able to earn profit using the internet, either through displaying advertisements on web pages or something called micropayments. I figure you have all seen an advertisement before, but you've likely never seen a micropayment. So I think you can get an idea of which way of thinking won. Anyway, micropayments were essentially just small payments you'd make to be able to do things on the internet. Want to read an article? Okay, just pay 10 cents. Want to download a picture? That'll be 50 cents. Which is a bargain, since people today pay 50 ETH for pictures of these ugly apes. Jokes aside, many people believed micropayments were going to be everywhere in the future. But the current way of using them kind of sucked. You pretty much had to use a credit card. Every credit card came with fees, and they were sometimes just as large as the micropayment you were making. Ecash could complete transactions for fractions of a penny. Another downside of credit cards was that every website you made a payment on would have your full name, address, and of course your credit card number. This was a huge privacy and safety concern. Even today, you likely think twice about putting your credit card in on an unfamiliar website. But it was even scarier back then. The internet was an unregulated wild west and you had no idea who you could trust. With a system like eCash, you could make thousands of micropayments a day without revealing anything about yourself. Or let's say you just wanna send some money to a buddy. You can't really do that with a credit card and things like PayPal and Venmo didn't exist yet. Transferring Cyberbucks using eCash was as simple as clicking a button. Or let's say you wanna sell something online, but you have no desire to start an online business. You can't accept credit card payments, but you could accept eCash. Now, eBay launched in 1995, but before 1999, you had to mail checks in in order to buy anything, a process that would take at least 10 days, if not usually more. This is a system that would have benefited massively from something like eCash. By now, you probably see just how revolutionary eCash was. Now, in order to actually use eCash, it wasn't as simple as signing up for an account online. Banks had to license the software and could then offer its services to customers. It started with small local banks, but later massive banks like Deutsche Bank got on board. Assuming you're signed up with a bank that uses eCash, your computer would communicate with the bank, the software would get loaded up with eCash, and then you could spend it anywhere on the internet. You could also use your eCash in the real world using smart cards and digital wallets, but the process was much more complex. Regardless, the internet side of it was amazing. It was like nothing ever seen before, and anyone who was anyone wanted to use eCash. But that's where the problem started to pop up. eCash had companies banging on their door, wanting to buy them out or make deals to integrate eCash into their services. But it seemed like every big deal fell through. Two of the three major Dutch banks made partnership deals worth tens of millions of dollars, but that never went anywhere. Visa offered a $40 million investment, but they were turned down. Netscape, the biggest browser in the world at the time, wanted to integrate eCash into their browser, no deal. Worst of all, Microsoft wanted to integrate eCash into Windows 95 and even offered DigiCash $100 million to do so. As you guessed, that never ended up happening. Why were all these amazing deals falling through? Well, it's believed the problem was Chom himself. Despite being a genius scientist, many of Chom's employees were reportedly not happy with him. He was a control freak, didn't trust his employees, and constantly changed his mind on where things were going. The most common word used to describe him by ex-employees was paranoid. 
For example, a deal was made with a company called ING Investment Management and Goldman Sachs to list Digicash on a stock exchange within the next two years. The day everyone was set to sign the papers, Chom refused. Raymond Stoffberg, an ex-employee, said he was so paranoid that he always thought something was wrong. There were eight people from ING, including the CEO, and David simply refused to sign. The visa deal fell through because Chom supposedly asked for $75 million at the last second instead of just 40. The Netscape deal fell through because Chom allegedly tried to get everyone to sign non-disclosure agreements before negotiations even started. But what about the Microsoft deal? Chom supposedly refused to do the deal unless they agreed to give him one or two dollars for every copy of Windows 95 sold. Windows 95 sold about 40 million copies in its first year, so that 100 million they were offering him would have more than covered that. Chom's employees became understandably annoyed. The entire world was literally bowing at their feet trying to use this product, but Chom just couldn't make a deal. 11 of the company's most important employees made a plan to give him a simple choice. You're out or we're out. Two of those 11 went to Chom before the plan could happen. He panicked, made them interim managers, and disappeared into the background for a while. Even with this mess of internal politics, people were still clamoring to invest in Digicash. And in 1997, the company was bought out by venture capitalists. They immediately appointed a new CEO, Michael Nash, an industry veteran from Visa. According to an article from back then, most employees didn't seem to like Nash either. Apparently, he was in talks with Swatch to put eCash in watches for some reason, and opened an office in Palo Alto, California for really no logical reason, which skyrocketed company costs. Regardless, it seemed too little too late for Digicash. Most banks weren't in a hurry to implement eCash anymore, because they already made a ton of money off credit cards, and by now, it didn't seem like eCash was going to be the next big thing. Consumers didn't want to use eCash because there wasn't as much of a concern with fraud and privacy as Chom predicted there would be. If someone steals your credit card, the bank has to deal with the repercussions you're almost guaranteed to have your money returned to you. Micropayments never took off either, so credit card fees for buying online really weren't much of an issue. By 1998, Digicash was spending well over a million dollars a month and getting nowhere, but they had one last bastion of hope. They were in talks with Citibank to allow their nearly 70 million customers the ability to use eCash. Citibank at the time was known to be very competitive and aggressive. If they got eCash and it took off, other banks would be clamoring to catch up. While discussions were ongoing, Citibank merged with a financial services company called Travelers Group. This merger would make them the biggest bank in the world, and all eyes in the industry were on them. But then everything fell apart. It's unclear why, but soon after the merger, the deal with Digicash fell through. Although some attribute it to the fact that Citibank's stock price plummeted over 50% not long after the merger. It wouldn't make much sense to invest in something as experimental as Digicash right after that. After this, Digicash tried to cling on to dear life, but it was too late. The CEO had been fired and replaced, employees were joining and leaving like a revolving door, and as a result, just a few months later, the company closed its doors, and eCash was no more. But you might be wondering, what happened to Chom? How does he feel about Bitcoin successfully implementing what he couldn't? Well, in the interviews I found where that was discussed, he sort of just dodged the question. I mean, if I were him, I would too. But he's very much into modern cryptocurrency. He started something he calls the XX Network, and as you might have guessed, it's focused entirely on privacy. I won't get into the project's fundamentals because I haven't done that much research on it, but honestly, it does look kind of cool for what it is. Now, what about eCash? Where's that? Well, unlike decentralized cryptocurrencies, because eCash was centralized, as soon as the company closed, so did everything eCash related. However, someone has taken the name eCash and used it for their own cryptocurrency. As far as I could find, they have no connection to Chom whatsoever, and the coin itself is just a forked version of Bitcoin Cash. Now, the past doesn't always predict the future, but it can help us understand and prepare for it. So, if you want to learn more cool crypto history, check out the video over on the right about when Kanye West tried to sue Dogecoin. Thanks for watching.